We've made it as far as Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, come as far as Isaiah's call. In the year that King Uzziah died, he says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each having six wings, with two he covered his face, with two his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to the other and said, <clears throat> Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the doors were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged, your sin is atoned for. You have this vision that Isaiah sees, the glory of God upon his throne. He sees those burning ones, those seraphim, the six wings. And Isaiah says when he saw that, he's unraveled, he's undone, he's falling apart. Because he knows he's a sinner and he's in the presence of holy God. And he, and he lives in the land of, of sinners. And so they bring this coal to him, interesting with tongs, you know, it's so holy. You know, this can be several pictures if you want. It could be a picture of the holy wrath of God. You can't touch that, you know. You're never going to be able to get through that. How hot is it? White hot wrath of God that can only be, that can only be satisfied with the innocent blood of Christ, the, the innocent substitute. And it touches his lips and he's cleansed. And nothing to do with works, nothing to do with effort. This is God's action on his behalf. Now, it's interesting, in this passage, we're going to run across the name the Lord of hosts. And you can, you can read the first five books of Moses, the Torah. You'll never run across uh, the Lord of hosts. It's not in Joshua. It's not in Judges. Even in the historical books, it's only mentioned two or three times. But here in the prophets, it's everywhere. The Lord of hosts is everywhere. In Jeremiah, 88 times. In Haggai, which is just two chapters, 14 times. In Zechariah, over 50 times. And here in Isaiah, over 60 times. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of armies. Jesus in John chapter 12, when the religious leaders are rejecting him and people are walking away from him, he says this. He says, while you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke and departed from them and was hidden from them. But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe him that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke... Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? That's Isaiah 53 he's quoting there. Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. That's a quote out of this chapter, Isaiah chapter 6. These things Isaiah, the same Isaiah said, when he saw his glory and spoke of him. The context of that passage is Christ, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. He, he's also called Adonai in this chapter. He's also called Jehovah in this chapter. This vision he is seeing is amazing because there is one on the throne. Who is that one? Do you know that one? Isaiah 6, 8. I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Singular. Whom shall I send? And then the rest of it. And who will go for us? The plural. 
That reminds me of the God of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and he goes through and he says, then he says, let us make man in our own image. Who's us? So many people want to put the angels in there. I'm not created in an angel's image. I'm created in God's image. <laughs> Here's God, I and us. Then Isaiah, you know, the Lord says, whom will I send? Whom will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Here is a man that's been completely humbled. He's seen his sin. He's recognized it. He's confessed it. He's been undone. He's falling apart and he's come into contact with the holy God. And God makes provision for him through the altar. And he's cleansed undeservedly, freely cleansed. So he's lived through what it's like to be a sinner. He's lived through what God demands. He's felt God's love and his goodness about freely being forgiven, and now he's ready to go. You know, our world doesn't need another lawyer with all the answers, with, with all the facts and all the figures. Some of those studied people can quote chapter and verse of the scripture. But what our world really needs is a witness. Someone who has actually walked through what they're talking about. Someone that's actually been transformed, you know, changed. Someone who has received. And that has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do with a relationship being in fellowship with God. Our world has seen and heard lots of religious stuff. What they need is reality. It's who we know that really matters. They won't even care about who you know until they know you care about them. So then he says in verse 9, and he said, go and tell this people Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Okay, Isaiah, you've had this great experience. You want to go speak for me, then go. But understand this. And this is what nobody in the church understands. You need to understand this. They are not going to listen to you. Understand this. They will choose not to hear and not to see. As a matter of fact, your constant teaching, your constant preaching and sharing will make their hearts dull. Did you catch that, what he just said there? Their eyes will grow heavy. Oh, here he goes again. You know, their ears, they will just choose to clog up. Can, give me anything but listen to this guy, you know. God is telling his servant, this servant with a perfect message, that we're sinners, that God is loving and forgiving. He's provided a way through the altar, and he's willing to cleanse. As soon as you respond to him, that perfect message your activity will actually harden most people's hearts. They will actually pay less attention to you now than they did before. Church, are you willing to hear what God is telling you about ministry? Are you willing to fight a seemingly losing battle? <laughs> now the victory is already won in Christ. He has won the war. The victory is over. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the King of Kings. And there is no way of stopping him. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because Satan can't even change his number from 666 to 667. No, it's all written out. It's going to be God's way. It's going to happen that way. 
But are you willing to fight in spite of seeming ineffectiveness? You remember the story as Moses is growing old and he's ready to pass off the scene. God says, hey, Moses, I want you to go get Joshua and bring him over here to the tent of meeting. And so he does. He goes and gets Joshua. Hey, Joshua, God wants to talk to you. And that, that's got to kind of make you wonder. You, me, he wants to talk to me? Okay. So they'll get back to the tent. And then God, instead of speaking to Joshua, he speaks to Moses and runs through everything the people have done. They've disobeyed. They've acted up. They're not thankful. They're a bunch of whiners, a bunch of hypocrites. They're all of these things. Here's all the problems. And then he tells them the future. The children of Israel are going to come into the land that I give them. And then they're going to turn away from me. And they're going to worship idols. And they're going to stop listening to me and to you. And I will carry them away into bondage and disperse them to the nations and then the Lord turns to Joshua, and he says, Joshua, that's going to be your job. So I want you to be strong. I want you to be of good courage, for I am with you. How would you like to be Joshua right there? But wait, wait, you just said what I'm going to be working at. You know, Joshua's already 100 years old. Can you imagine getting this at 100 years old? Your next uh, 30 or 40 years, you know, whatever you're going to last, it's going to be miserable. It's going to be the hardest thing you've ever done because you're going to try to lead them this way and they're going to go every way but that way. Your remaining years are going to be frustration. An uphill battle at best and complete failure at worst. <laughs> and yet God says to Joshua, you're my man. You're the guy I'm calling. Let's go with me. I'm going to be with you. You know, I choose you. I'm going to be with you. Don't lose heart. Be of good courage. Put a smile on your face. Buck up, buddy. Let's go do this. But it won't ever be what you think it should be. It won't ever add up to what you really want it to add up to. It's going to be a seeming failure at the end. But be of good cheer. I'm with you. <laughs> Does the fact that God chose you and wants you and will be with you way more than all of those things you want to accomplish? That is a great question. Jeremiah, who served the Lord for decades, we don't hear of a single convert during his service time. Not a single individual. What held Jeremiah? The Lord was with him. <laughs> all the kings that he spoke to, all the people that he prophesied for and, and gave them the illusions and tried to draw them to the Lord, we don't know their names. Some of us are kind of familiar with the names because, you know, we're Bible people. We go through it every once in a while. But, you know, we, we don't remember their names, but we remember Jeremiah. Isn't it funny? Isaiah will minister for over 50 years in Israel. And we know only a few victories. But what we know most is the nation fades away under his ministry. <laughs> and I got to ask, you know, who do we think we are sometimes? I'm going to go out there and I'm going to change the world for Jesus. And I hope you do. I'll pray for you. Maybe you don't want that because things I pray for usually, you know, I don't know. But many of us will only affect, really affect a very few. Perhaps it's just one or two that we have any great effect upon. It might be a friend, it might be a son or a daughter, a grandchild, it might be a parent. Here's the thing if God has given you 
any victory at all? Praise God. Because that ground is hard won in this dark old world. You know, I think about me being called the Rexford. And this passage, you know, it's so personal to me. Because this is my life. It's been this kind of ministry. It's been small. It's been hard, you know. It's been lonely. It's been uphill. <laughs> I have been, we have been in this city for 13 years, and nobody knows we exist here. I find that interesting all the time. But God sent me here. He sent me here for you guys. He sent me here for me. So I needed to learn some stuff. I needed to grow. It's been inch by inch. Our growth has not been explosive. It's been deep. It's been depth. It's been higher. It's been closer. Here's God's word for us. Be strong. Be of good courage, for I am with you. And that must weigh more than any other desire we have. But oh, I can think of a wonderful few occasions. Can't you? Faces that we've seen come through this place. Faces that have been transformed and changed. When someone's eyes have been opened, <laughs> When someone's ears did perk up, you know, and their heart went out to God in response, and they repent, and they're converted, and they're saved. Oh, those wonderful miracles. I'll, I'll never forget those. You see, when you preach, when you share God's word, what you're really doing is turning on the light. <laughs> and that light reveals who people really are. That's what it does. It reveals the hard hearts, the dull hearts. It reveals the unwillingness of people to see truth and to hear truth. It also reveals the hearts that are open and the ears that are open and the eyes that are open. And that respond to that message. You see, God does not blind people. God does not harden people. God's word reveals if that heart is hardened, or if their eyes are closed, or if their ears are stuffed up, you know. It brings out the true condition of who you're talking to. That's what God's word does. You know, Jesus quotes this passage in Matthew 13, 14. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see and your ears for they hear. Are you hearing? Can you see? Well, that is a blessed condition to be in. Church, it is our honor and our business to sow the word of God no matter what the soil looks like. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to make that sowing effective in hearts. Not our job. He brings the increase. And it has been my great honor over these past years just to share God's light, just to share His Word, and let whosoever come. The whosoever's, right? So verse 11 says this, then I said, Lord, how long? <laughs> Do you love that? <laughs> Can you give me the business hours, Lord? When's the retirement plan kick in? 
you know, when's this going to change? And he answered, and he said, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant, the houses without a man, and the land is utterly desolate. How long am I going to have to do this, Lord? I can't tell you how many times I've asked that on a Monday morning, a Sunday evening. Can't, I can't tell you how many times. It's been a few. Isaiah, God says, you are going to walk through this entire story until it's time for judgment. But understand this, you're going to be walking with me. You're going to be salt and you're going to be light. And you're going to be my voice until this whole land is desolate. And that is absolutely true because they drug them away at the end of Isaiah's life. Verse 12. The Lord has removed men far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it and will remain and be for consuming as a chiburneth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. When you cut down certain trees, the oak, the chiburneth tree, even though you can't see anything left, it's just cut right down, it's just an old stump sitting out there, those trees still have life in them. Those trees will still shoot up a, a new tree, a, a new life, a new branch. They will regrow because life is in them. So God tells Isaiah that there is perf purpose in his work even though you won't see it. Even though it looks like it's being cut down. Even though it look, looks like it's being just taken away. Nothing remains. No, there is purpose there. There is life there. How do you measure success? Is it some kind of reward? Oh, 50 people got saved last week. Oh, the tithing is way up. Oh, this is going on. Oh, we're, we're spreading out. We're doing. How do you measure success? Is it reward or is it obedience? Because but God measures it one way. Obedience. Because he's in charge of making it prosper. He's in charge of bringing the increase. And he says, there's going to be a tenth, a tithe. There's going to be a holy remnant left. And those are going to be like trees who are seemingly cut down, chopped off. But oh no, don't believe that. There's still life within them. And now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Syria, don't you love it when he does these things and he puts in so many names, it takes you 20 minutes to figure out where he is and what he's talking about. That Rezin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but they could not prevail against it. And it was told... To the house of David, saying, Syria's forces are deployed in Ephraim. So his heart and the heart of the people were moved as the trees of the woods are moved with the wind. So let's figure this out. Pekka, the son of Ramalia, king of Israel. He's the king of the northern ten tribes. Judah is the southern two tribes. You guys know this. He is in cohorts, a confederation, with the king of Syria, a guy named Rezin. And Isaiah is seeing all of this, but it hasn't happened yet. And he tells the king, this is what's going to happen. This confederacy is going to come up, going to sweep through Judah and it's going to take all of Judah, but it cannot penetrate Jerusalem. But Ahaz, the king, and the people, the people of Judah, their hearts are going to be so moved. It's like watching trees in the wind. They're just blowing to and fro. Now Ahaz, you guys know this, is a wicked king. 
He wants nothing to do with God. He wants nothing to do with anything really spiritual. He's turned away from the Lord. He is an idolatrous man. He's in idolatrous worship, even sacrificing his own son to Molech in the fire. That is a son of David doing that to another son of David, to an idolatrous God, burning him alive. And instead of turning to the Lord for help with this battle, he sends word to a guy named tiglath Pileser in Assyria, begging him for help. And in spite of what Isaiah is saying to him, oh, if you just turn to the Lord, the Lord would be with you. He doesn't do that. Ever met somebody like that? You're trying to give them godly advice and they just refuse to listen. Oh, Mark, I appreciate everything you're saying, you know, and, and I know there's a God and all of that stuff. That's great. But let's get real. I need to help right now. I don't see God stepping in like you're, like you're telling me he's going to step into. And so they turn to the wor world for help. What we need is something practical. We need practical, logical advice right now. <laughs> Ever heard that? And in order to impress tiglath Pileser, Ahab has to go in and ramsack the temple, strip its walls of gold and remove some stones and you know, do all of this stuff for a down payment for this guy to come and help him out. And then Tiglath comes with the Assyrian army and they go to Damascus, the, the head of Syria, and they just ransack it. They just dismantle it, tear it apart. When Pekah, king of Israel, comes north, excuse me, comes south with the Syrian guy named Rezin, they can't get into Jerusalem, but they can get everywhere else. And he ends up killing 120,000 Israelis, 120,000 cousins, nephews, relatives. And he takes 200,000 of them slaves. That is 320,000 lives. Think about that. Vietnam cost us 54,000 Americans. This is 230,000. 320,000, sorry. Got my numbers all mixed up. And we don't even know how many resin king of Syria carried away. But eventually tiglath Pileser is victorious. Ahab goes up north to meet him and he's blown away by this big idolatrous altar that Tiglath has brought with him. This is where he sacrifices to his God. And so Ahab brings some of the priests from down south up north and he says, study this thing, measure it out, draw it, take some photos of it, you know, get it on your Facebook thing and take it back home and build me an altar exactly like this. And they do. And they replace God's altar with this altar. And he enforces worship on this altar from that time forth. That is Solomon's temple altar. That is David's temple altar. The one he got from God, the blueprints and stuff. It says in verse 3, Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go now and meet Ahaz. You and Sher Jerob, your son, at the end of the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint hearted, for those two stubs of smoking firebrands, for the fear of those guys, for the fierce anger of Rezin and Syria, the son of Ramalia. Do not fear these two guys. Isaiah, you and your son, your little kid, Sheer jo Now I've lost it. Sheer Jashub. 
His name means a remnant will return. <laughs> you go and meet Ahab. Where? Go, go to the end of the aqueduct. Don't, don't get in the middle of the pipe. You know, there's this aqueduct that goes from outside the wall of Jerusalem to inside the wall of Jerusalem. And that's where he is. He's studying the waterworks and making sure inside they've got everything they need during a battle, during a siege. Meet him at the end of this Gihon Spring, near the aqueduct, on the highway, and tell him, listen up. <laughs> Don't you love it when some prophet of God says that to you? Yo, Bob, listen up. Got something to say for you. He says, take heed and be quiet. And the idea of being quiet isn't shutting up. The idea of being quiet is being at rest. Be at rest in yourself. Don't fear. Do not be faint-hearted. Now, this is God speaking to an idolatrous king who doesn't deserve to sit on David's throne, but that's where he's sitting. He's don't, don't, be, don't be afraid of those two hotheads that are coming this way. Because you have David's blood. You have royal blood in your veins. Verse 5, because Syria, Ephraim, and the sons of Ramalia have plotted evil against you, saying, Let us go up to Judah and trouble it, and let us make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set a king over them, the son of Tabel. God warns him what's going to take place. He tells him ahead of time, This is what the army coming against you is thinking. This is nothing but God's grace. <laughs> this is what they're planning. They're planning on coming up here, breaking through the wall of Jerusalem, and setting up their own vassal king. Now what they're really doing is they're thumbing their nose at God. Because God has said, this is my city, and this is my throne, and on my throne will sit a son of David continually. And these guys could care less about that. And you've got to remember, this is three-quarters of Israel up north, right? They know this God. They should. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. <laughs> oh, the full assurance of God. This shall not stand. Ain't going to happen. It's not going to come to pass. Satan, no matter who he uses or who he brings to the battle... God's word will stand firm in spite of that. Jerusalem has always been this spiritual battleground. For centuries, they were always under attack because it's God's chosen city. One day, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to reign and rule from there on the throne of David. Interesting idea, isn't it? That whole area, you know, Abraham was called to sacrifice his son there on the mount in the area of Jerusalem. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. No wonder Israel is a cup of trembling in the last days to all nations. Because there's such a spiritual battleground there, it rubs off into the physical. And it becomes a, a physical battleground. All of the nations surrounding Israel wish they would just go away. Wish they would just disappear. They have no right to exist. They're on our land. I'm sorry. You stole that land from God and God just took it back from you, you fool. It's God's land. He owns all the land and he gave it to them forever. You should study that a little bit. Satan, the god of this age, wants it. He wants it destroyed. And he's always against the Jewish people. Because anti-Semitism is always demonic in its ways and in its thinking. You know, it's so interesting that, you know, science wants to disprove this in the worst way, but they never have. That 
all of creation is geocentric. It's all based around the earth, everything. We're in the perfect place in the universe to get the best look of everything in the universe. I wonder who placed this right there, you know? And on earth, everything is centered around Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, everything is centered around a little hill called Golgotha the place where Jesus was crucified upon a cross. Because it was before the creation of the world that the Lamb of God was slain. It's the focus of everything of creation. Therefore, their plan will not stand because it goes against me, it goes against my direction, my guidance. Verse 8 for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is resin. And within 65 years, East Ephraim will be broken, so it will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is Ramallah's son, Pekka. If you will not believe, sure, surely you will not be established. He, God says, within 65 years, those northern tribes aren't going to be there anymore. They're going to be gone. Because Assyria is going to come in and drag them away in two waves, but they're going to do it. But if you fail to believe me, then you will also fail to be established. Oh, the need for repentance, the need to believe God and what he says. If this king would have just gone to Isaiah and said, oh, Isaiah, I've been an idiot. I've been a fool, and I've done this, and I've done that. God, will you bring a lamb? Will you come with me to the sacrifice and show me how to get right with God? God would have received him, and he would have become a great king. <laughs> but instead, here comes this prophecy. You know, Isaiah 26.3 it, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. He says these two firebrands, these two kings that are troubling you right now, we know from history within two years they both die. Within two years of this prophecy, they both are gone. You know, the king of Syria, Rezin, and Pekka, the son of Ramalia, those ones are they're, they're off the scene. This is not a long-term problem. But if you don't believe that, nothing really changes for you. You know, Hebrews 11.6, For without faith it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. These northern ten tribes are... are uh, removed in two waves. After the second wave, none of them remain. And this 65 years is after that second wave. And after they drag the native people out of there, the 10 tribes, Dan and you know, Manasseh and Ephraim and all of those, they drag them away. Then they bring in foreign people to keep the land productive for the kingdom. And the people who were planted in Samaria came back to the government the next year and said, we need to understand the God of this land. Because right now, you know, there's pestilence in the fields and we can't really grow anything and the wild animals are, are picking on us. And, you know, it won't rain in this land. And so we need to understand the God of this area. And, you know, back then people were, you had a God everywhere. And so they thought there was a specific God over this specific area. And so the Assyrians send some of the priests from up north and they send them back. Go teach the people about this God. And here you have these priests who haven't taught and haven't lived this for years and years, teaching these Gentile people that have moved in about the God of Israel, <laughs> of the Jews, how to worship him properly. 
these same priests who wouldn't teach their people how to do that. They were teaching their people how to bow down to the golden calves. And they mix what they learn with what they already knew from the gods of other lands, and they become the Samaritans. Right? You guys know about those in the New Testament, the Samaritans. The Jews thought they were half-breeds. They only understood half, and they kind of wanted to step into Judaism, but not, not bad enough to, to forget everything they, they used to do. They embraced the first five books of Moses, but nothing else about God. Then in verse 10, Moreover, the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask for a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depths or in the heights above. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. <laughs> oh, the Lord. He is so long-suffering with us, isn't he? You, you look at this. Ask for a sign. God says, ask for a sign. Oh, oh, I would never do that. I would never tempt God like that. See, God sees he's afraid. He sees he's caught up in the world. He sees he needs, let me just show you what I can do. Let me show you something that, you know, will change your mind about me. But Ahaz has already made a deal with Tiglath Pileser by this time and, and he's trying to hide it from God and I don't need you involved in my business so just get away. He doesn't want to believe in anything spiritual, anything supernatural. God says, just ask. Whether it's in the depths or the heights, Imagine God giving you a blank check like that. What would you ask for? <laughs> Ahaz actually comes back with scripture. Like a hypocrite does. Because he doesn't believe in the scripture. You shall not tempt the Lord thy God out of Deuteronomy. The Lord quotes that, of course, to Satan. But it's some kind of false humility that he brings up. So in verse 13, then he said, Hear now, O house of David. Notice he's no longer talking to Ahaz. Is it a small thing for you to worry men, but will you worry my God also? Will you worry God? Now we know God doesn't sleep or slumber. He has no need of rest like we do. He doesn't get tired. but wearied. You know, he says, I'm holding my hands out for a stubborn and obnoxious people and I'm still holding them out. Don't you think I'm getting tired of that? I'm getting weary of that. You know, in, in the days of Noah, it says that the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. He, he's going to wait just so long. And then judgment is going to come. Verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The Lord himself will give you and I like it because it's plural. The Lord himself will give y'all, you know, you got to go from the south here, the house of David, a sign. Behold. And that word means consider this. Stop and really think about this. The virgin. Not a virgin. The virgin. It's a definite article. This is talking about a specific woman shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Now some want to fight over all this wording in here. It's really fun because they use the word Alma and they say, well, it just means a young woman shall conceive. What kind of a sign is that? Have you ever known of a young woman to conceive and bring forth a son? Oh, that happens every day. That happens hundreds of times every day. The word always speaks of an unmarried woman of marrying age. Now in the Old Testament, if you were an unmarried woman of marrying age and you were found with a child, you were killed. 
they would bury you in front of your parents' house under a thing of trees and a big pile of rocks. And you would be ever known as that one, that unfaithful. In the Septuagint, you know, the Greek version done by 72 scholars about 200 years before Christ, with no axe to grind about Christ being virgin born, they translate it Parthenos, virgin, an untouched woman. And in the Masoretic text, some 400 years after Christ, four to 600 years after Christ, they, they already had a prejudice. And they say that the word doesn't have to mean virgin. But, you know, it's so interesting. You, you, go, you know your alma mater? Your alma mater is your virgin mother, the, the school that you went to, graduated from. He says, this is going to be a sign to all of you in the house of David. It's not just some young lady that conceives. It's a virgin. It's not just a virgin, it's the virgin. And she's going to conceive, which is an interesting idea, and bring forth a son and call his name Emmanuel. Now, in the New Testament, as the angel appears to Joseph when he's praying about what to do with Mary because she's found with child, it says in Matthew 1.21, And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. That's his name. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's what Jesus means. Yeshua, Joshua. He will save his people from his sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God, God with us. Isn't it interesting that the angels point back to Isaiah and said when Isaiah was saying that, he was speaking of your wife and of the child that's in her. And she was a virgin. Now, you don't have to believe in the virgin birth. That's fine with me. It doesn't affect me at all. But you can't tell me the Bible doesn't teach it. It actually starts in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you, speaking of, the, of Satan, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Nowhere else in the New Test nowhere else in the Old Testament does a woman have a seed. The woman has the egg. The man has the seed. But right here in prophecy, this is the virgin birth. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. So you may not believe it, but unless the Holy Son of God came down and took on flesh and that flesh was sinless flesh and went to the cross to save us, you have no Savior. He cannot be Savior, Emmanuel, without being virgin born because sin passes from the blood of the father to the child in that process. So that's why he has a human mother, but no human father, because God has to be his father. Verse 15, curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse evil and choose good. For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose good. The land that you dread will be forsaken by both her kings. Now we know that diet isn't part of the Lord. It isn't really what sets you apart. But this was the diet of the poor and the less fortunate in the days of Christ. When Mary and Joseph bring Jesus into the temple, they bring an offering of two turtle doves. Now, the offering, according to the law, was to be lamb, two lambs. But for the poor, two turtle doves were allowed. God took on humility, and God becomes a man, born in a barn, you know, hum 
humiliating. And he knows even as a child to refuse evil and to choose good. In verse 16, For before the child shall know to refuse evil and choose to do good, the land that you dread will be forsaken by both of her kings. Now, this seems to be swinging back to the days of Isaiah, and we have this, this present and this future thing going on in prophecy. Because there's going to be a virgin in Isaiah's time that conceives and brings forth a son. And many scholars believe that is Isaiah's second wife. Isaiah's first wife died when she had her first child. And that Isaiah's second child may be this actual son in that picture. Good luck separating that. It's just one of those things you need to pay attention to as you read through. There's a sign back in their day that is ultimately fulfilled when Christ comes in his day. Verse 17, The Lord will bring the king of Assyria upon you and your people and your father's house, days that have not come since the days of Ephraim departed from Judah, from the time of Rehoboam. When Rehoboam split the kingdom and took the ten tribes and went north and says, We have nothing to do with you, Judah. We have no portion with you in the house of David. Unlike anything they had seen in their day, times are going to come. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is from the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is the, in the land of Assyria. Now these are idioms. You know, the fly in Egypt, it's a picture of the Egyptian army, and they were like flies. They were like pests. They would pester the heck out of it. There's just thousands of them, and they're everywhere. Multitudes without number. And then the bee, the hornet of Assyria, because Assyria had a sting. They were cruel. They're like hornets. God is warning Ahab that his secret alliance with Assyria is ultimately going to backfire on you and they will become your enemies and they will come and take you away. But in order to change that, you first got to believe in God. Remember that? But unless you believe, none of this stuff's really going to matter to you. Verse 19, they will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on the thorns and all the pastures. In the same day, the Lord will shave with a hired razor. With those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair and the legs, and will also remove the beard. This idea of shaving. You remember the story when David sent some emissaries north and they thought they were spies, and so they cut off their beards, and they shaved off their, their robes, you know, to expose their, their backsides, and sent them back home, and it was a shameful thing. It's a sign of humiliation in Israel. But here, God is going to borrow a razor to do a little shaving. He's going to borrow this razor from Assyria. You know, every time Israel was invaded by the Assyrians, by the Turks, by the Romans, those armies would come into the land and cut down every tree in sight. They would leave it just bald. You know, when the Jews came back into the land in 1948, it was full of swamps and deserts, and they had to replant every tree that is there today. Every single one. <laughs> and now, everything is green. Now, the Jordan Valley is the most productive piece of land on the planet. They have increased their rainfall by like 20%. It's a garden. It's the fruit of Israel. God's always working in this little community, this Israel. 
In the year that they became a nation, 1948, the year that they were reborn as a nation, down in Qumran, some little Jordanian kids were throwing rocks, and they heard a little clunk, you know, and it's like, what was that? So they go searching in these caves, and they find a cave full of jars, and a couple of the jars are broken, and in them are these really old scrolls, and they take them to their fathers, and the fathers take them to their fathers, and nobody knows what to do with them, and they end up in New York City for sale. All of these scrolls. Well, the Israelis already have a, you know, intelligence service, and they find out about them, and so they hire a Palestinian to go in and purchase them, and they, they purchase them for pennies on the dollar, just dirt cheap. And they end up bringing them back to Israel, and the same year that Israel is born as a nation, they receive this gift of the entire scroll, 52 feet long, of the book of Isaiah, word for word, as we have it here in our Bible. <laughs> when they excavated Masada, the place where the last remaining stronghold of Israel was when the Romans came through, they found the stones that the people inscribed their family's name on. And then they would take those stones and they would get the men of the community and they would hand a stone to each man and they would go to that household and kill everybody in that house and then come back and then they drew stones on which man would kill all the other men because they refused to go into Roman slavery. And it's interesting, in the excavation of that place they found a chunk of the book of Isaiah, the scroll of Isaiah. <laughs> Chapters 36, 37, 38, and 39. It describes the rebirth of Israel and their next battle that lies ahead. The place of their last battle, God gives them the picture, battle's not over, still going on. How amazing is it? It's just a coincidence, I'm sure, that that kind of stuff just happens in Israel. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he will eat curds. For curds and honey, everyone will eat who is left in the land. Now, the abundance of milk doesn't mean prosperity. What it means is all the calves are dying. It means it's very hard times. It's not a good thing. And they're going to go back to the simplest of foods again. Honey, you just go out in the wilds and you find wild honey, you find wild bees. Curds, just milk, just animals. And it shall happen in that day that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth of a thousand shekels of silver, it will be for briars and thorns. With arrows and bows, men will come there because all the land will become briars and thorns. There's going to come a day because of your unwillingness, because of your hard hearts, because you're not willing to listen, when everything's just going to dry up and blow away. Verse 25, And to any hill which could be dug with a hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but it will become a range for oxen and a place for sheep to roam. But there will always be a remnant. Poverty, hardship, warfare, always. But always God has a remnant. Hmm, Father, we pray for your remnant tonight. Lord, your church, who you've drawn out, Lord, they may be overwhelmed, they may be outgunned, they may be in dire straits. But God, you have them. And God, we are thankful for that. 
God, I find myself almost praying, God, that you would take your people home through death and through suffering and through hardship because at least they're prepared. Because the enemy, the world, is not prepared for death, is not prepared for hardship. And that, God, you might have mercy, that you might pity them, and show them a little grace. Draw them to yourself. Lord, we ask for just one more sermon that they might hear. Just one more act of love. Just one more sharing of the gospel. That just one more might hear and might be changed. Oh God, we know <laughs> being in your service and in your ministry can be frustrating and hard and seemingly unproductive. God, you knew that going in and you warned us of it. And Lord, we're still here because we will still choose your way whatever the cost. Lord. So be with us and be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.